said that. And then you destroy the Constitution gradually. That's what's happening inside America. First of all, we've stopped teaching it. You'd be surprised if you look at a textbook today in the public schools, and God bless the state of Texas, by the way, because they're starting to turn this around. There is so little focus on the Constitution of the United States. That's why when I sit down with my seniors as I teach them, I ask them questions about the Constitution, and they don't even know what's in that document. I carry a Constitution with me all the time. Mm -hmm. My wife gave me one and, and inscribed a little inscription in it, and I get emotional when I, when I read it to people. It's up in my room right now. It's a little black Constitution that she gave me. And uh, I'm not even going to tell you what. I'll get emotional and I'll embarrass myself. But, <laughs> but it was a very nice little inscription. And I carry that thing all the time. i got another one I carry in another pocket. I read it. I read the thing on the, on the airplane. But you know what? There are very few Americans in this country today that know what that Constitution is all about. They don't, they don't know how it was written, what it was intended to be, and they don't know what's in it. And when you do, when you get to that point, you're losing your identity as a nation. You're really losing your identity in a nation. They don't know what the Second Amendment really says and what it was meant to be. A well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state. The rights of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And then people will come back and say, well, a militia. <laughs> um, oh, a militia. Well, we have the army now. We have the Marines now. No, the militia is you. The militia was every able-bodied man. In fact, in the state of Vermont, it was illegal, still is, not to own a weapon. But if you don't know what that Constitution says, you could be led in the wrong direction. And that's exactly what's happening today because we've stopped teaching about the Constitution. And we've denigrated the Founding Fathers. I'm reading my summer project is to read about the Constitution and the Founding Fathers. I've done that for the last five summers. I just finished a book on, uh, it's, a, it's a biography of Benjamin Franklin, and then I picked up one in the airport uh, called The Art of Power by a guy named John Meacham. And it, it's about Thomas Jefferson. And it's a big, thick book, and I'm, I, I'm enthralled by this book. But one of the things that struck me was in the preface of this thing in the prologue he said Thomas Jefferson was a very passionate man in fact he he fathered six children by Sally Hemming his slave woman do you realize that DNA has proven DNA tests have proven that he did not he did not father Sally Hemings children yet here you have a reputable New York Times best-selling author John Meacham who puts that right in the very front of the book. And it is an absolute lie, but it's all about denigrating these men as being nothing but a bunch of hypocritical old white men, many of which own slaves. And, and absolutely making no reference to the spiritual nature of these men. You see, the reality is many people even called Benjamin Franklin an atheist. Go read what he said. Go read what he wrote. The same thing with Thomas Jefferson. Do you realize more legislation was passed supporting Christianity and the worship according to the Christian faith under Thomas Jefferson than any other president? But we still call him a deist. Now David Barton went a long way in his book, The, the Jefferson Lies, to try and straighten that out. But this is all part of robbing us of our history, of our pride here in America. And then one of the other things that you do is you govern by fiat. If you can't get it through Congress, just sign an executive order. Right? How many of you have noticed that when you screw your light bulbs in now, they start out real nice, you can read, and then all of a sudden they go dim? That makes me so mad I want to choke somebody. <laughs> it frustrates me. That's just a government regulation to decide what kind of light bulbs we're going to have. That's, that's government by fiat. It's not a law. That was something that was passed by fiat. And then use 
you know, executive branch regulations to bypass the Congress. If you can't get through cap and trade, you just have the Environmental Protection Agency pass regulations or write regulations that do exactly the same thing as cap and trade. This is how you move this country to Marxism. And then do you disregard the laws of the land? On the 3rd of uh, June, a great friend of mine named Andy McCarthy, you may know him, you see him a lot on Fox, he's got a book out and it's about the lawlessness in America. It's about the lawlessness of the Obama administration, the how we are in a period of complete lawlessness. You don't enforce laws that you don't want to enforce. Immigration. Don't enforce the immigration laws. Now, I have to pay my taxes. You have to pay your taxes. That's one law that we enforce. But if the President of the United States doesn't want to enforce the law, he doesn't. And he uses the Attorney General to make sure that it's not enforced. Immigration laws. Decided that Defense of Marriage Act, which protected marriage as a relationship between a man and a woman, was not constitutional. The President decided that. And then he just decided he wouldn't enforce it. Eventually it got to the Supreme Court and that bunch of wimps refused to make a decision is basically what they did. And then about the War Powers Act. We went into Libya. We established a no-fly zone. We committed the sons and daughters of America to combat with no consultation with the Congress. You see, the 535 people in Washington are our representatives. They are supposed to be, according to the law, consulted unless an, it's an in extremist situation where we have to respond immediately to save Americans. Now that seemed to break down in Benghazi. Yeah. That seemed to not be much of an issue in Benghazi because we didn't respond at all. But we went into Libya and we established a no fly zone and there's a regulation called the War Powers Act. And it says at the end of 90 days, if the president has not consulted Congress and gotten congressional consent, that he has to withdraw the forces. And at the end of that 90 days, they went to him and said, United Days is up. What are you going to do? He said, the War Powers Act's unconstitutional. What? I'm not pulling out. And nobody challenged it. That's the bad thing. Nobody challenged it. You see, our founding fathers gave us really three branches of government. They were... And by the way, in case you don't know the history, the executive branch was never intended to be the most powerful of those three branches. And by the way, in case you didn't know, inside our Congress, the Senate was never intended to be the most powerful of the two houses. It was the House of Representatives because they were elected every two years. And remember, originally, the Senate was appointed by state legislatures. We don't know our history. That's the problem. Today we we see all these things happening and a lot of it goes back to the fact that we can't understand it because we really don't know what the original intent was by our founding fathers. And then another part of the methodology is you control the judicial system. You appoint liberals to the bench. Now let me tell you something. Remember when Harry Reid executed the nuclear option? to cut off any filibusters, any debate on judicial nominees. Let me tell you what that was about. It was about the Tenth Circuit Court. There are nine circuit courts, and then there's a tenth one in Washington, D.C. And most of the future Supreme Court justices will come out of the D.C. Circuit Court. All right? You need to understand that. And look at the ones that have come out of the D.C. Circuit Court. So what Harry Reid, I talked to uh, Pat Toomey, the uh, senator from uh, Pennsylvania, and he sat down and explained this to me and some others. He said what Harry Reid was doing was, first of all, he was lying that this was a critical situation. He said the reality was, up to that point, Obama had nominated 411 nominees and only four had not been confirmed. Does that sound like a crisis to you? No, what made it a crisis was the fact that 
They wanted to get two liberal judges in the D.C. Circuit Court because they would extend their authority, their influence, their power would extend well beyond this administration. And Harry Reid was willing to risk losing the Senate to make sure that for the next 20 or 30 years, those two people were in that court making decisions that were going to still support this Marxist agenda. It was not a crisis. And then you file lawsuits as part of the judicial system. Remember when Jan Brewer signed legislation in Arizona basically saying that they would enforce federal statutes with regards to immigration. That's all it said. And they were immediately sued by the Justice Department. This is all part of controlling the judicial and then you criticize decisions unprecedented. Remember at a State of the Union speech, the president stood up and looked right on the front row at the nine Supreme Court justices and criticized them for a decision they had just made. Remember that? Unprecedented. No president has ever done that. But he looked down at them and criticized them publicly. Why? Because he was on TV and the whole country was going to hear it. You control the judicial because of all the things that the president has to do. Probably the most long-term, far-reaching is appointment of people to the bench. Whether it's the circuit court, or whether it's an appeals court, or whether it's the Supreme Court, that's the most long-term impact of anything. 